Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our webinar today, which is entitled Centering Lived Expertise, Supporting Culturally Specific and Victim Service Provider Access to HUD Fiscal Year 23, Notice of Funding Opportunity, Continuum of Care Funds. I just want to give some quick housekeeping. Um, we wanted to encourage everyone to um, introduce yourselves in the chat feature. Um, I see already people are naming who they are and where they're from. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we'd like to stay connected and continue the conversation. Obviously, this is a really um, big topic that we can't um, cover everything in one setting. This is meant for ongoing conversation. So um, as you are hearing things, and I'm about to introduce our panelists, um, I want you to, you know, stay tuned in to um, to what you're about to hear. And um, hopefully this can be of use to you in your local neighborhoods and your communities. Um, for introductions, our panelists today are Dee Fox um, from the National Network to End Domestic Violence. Um, thank you for presenting our overview today of the NOFO. And we will also have a round table discussion after the overview um, with uh, Maria Williams, Alexandra Cantrell, Tara Ulrich, Lori Sawinski, Tanoa Askernis, Nicole Amabel, and Aaron Brand. And I'll introduce them more and um, their agencies that they represent once we get into the roundtable discussion, which is going to be pretty robust. And they're doing incredible work in their um, organizations and in Pennsylvania. Um, um, today, I am moderating your uh, webinar. My name is Charlena Powell, and I'm with Bliss, which is Better Living in Innovative Sufficiency and Sustainability. And I'm really glad to be here with you all today and moderate our session. And I will go ahead and on to the next slide, please. Okay, so what are we here to do today? Um, we want to introduce the Domestic Violence and Housing Technical Assistance Consortium, which is DVH TAC, and uh, panel presenters from Pennsylvania in the United States who are implementing HUD Continuum of Care or COC housing resources in their state. We're also going to provide a national overview of the critical intersection of domestic violence, race, homelessness, and centering survivors with lived, ex lived expertise in planning and implementation. We want to learn best practices to adapt and implement HUD programs for culturally specific and victim service providers or VSPs. And we also want to learn how to build authentic partnerships and relational connections with survivors of lived experience or lived expertise. Um, then we want to in increase understanding among victim, for victim service providers and culturally specific organizations of the fiscal year 23 HUD NOFO and potential changes in the NOFO that could impact victim service providers in the application process. And we're going to review uh, the, re the core components of the domestic violence and sexual assault bonus project which is the $52 million set aside for domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking survivors, um, especially working on these housing subsidies of rapid rehousing, the joint component project, and coordinated entry services, and uh, coordinated entry systems, and key considerations for culturally specific and domestic violence sexual assault programs for both housing models. And I want to um, just preface that there are a few acronyms that are throughout our slides. I'm going to try to to, um, to unravel all of the acronyms so we can have a level set of the different terms that we're talking about. And if if I'm missing one, please, my team help with some acronyms in the chat. Um, we're going to be putting a load of things in the chat today, different links that you can review um, on your on your own time with your teams and um, really want to, you know, set the stage so you guys can take care of yourself. Um, please feel free to 
also note that today's webinar will be recorded. So you will have access to see the slides, hear the conversations and continuing in community. Okay, um, next slide, I wanna introduce our, um, our partners that the DVH hack um, could not do this work without and um, really are, are happy to share in their um, work, uh, critical work that they're doing to ending homelessness, especially homelessness for survivors um, that we're talking about today. Our federal partners include the Office of Violence Prevention and Services, or OFVPS, the Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs at HUD, the Office for Victims of Crime, or OVC, at the Department of Justice, or DOJ, the Office of Violence Against Women, or OVW, at the Department of Justice, and the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, or USICH, USICH. Um, um, USICH was also a uh, collaborator at our last webinar in 2022 um, that talked about this topic on culturally specific um, providers participating in the NOFO. So I want to say thank you um, for their guidance last year and also want to put into the chat the link to the webinar that we conducted last year to really learn more about this topic, engaging your community if you haven't seen it already or you didn't join in. Um, our TA providers, um, first, Collaborative Solutions, the Corporation for Supportive Housing, or uh, CSH, the National Network to End Domestic Violence, or NNEDV, the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence, or NRCDV, the Natural Sexual Violence Resource Center, or NSVRC, Safe Housing Alliance, or SHA, and safety, training, and technical assistance resources and support have been given by STARS, the Indigenous Safe Housing Center. If you need any resources on, um, on, on uh, tribal nations and di um, different types of uh, resources for um, indigenous communities, please reach out to STARS. They are experts in this field. And this year, as DFOX is going to talk about in just a few moments, um, um, you can apply specifically for um, for rural and indigenous, um, you know, uh, set asides specifically in the in the NOFO. So, um, so that's really exciting news to celebrate. This is the second year that it's happening. All right, and with that, I'm going to um, ask uh, DFOX to join us, please, in the next slide as we talk about an overview of the NOFO. And um, first, you know, talking a little bit about what the NOFO is and, you know, just um, level setting our ourselves for today. Thank you so much. Um, DFOX, please take it away. Hi, thank you so much, Charlena. I really appreciate the intro um, and getting us all started. I am DFOX and my pronouns are she, her, and they, them. And I work at the National Network to End Domestic Violence. I am the housing policy and, pra and practice person. So I just wanted to give a quick overview of the continuum of care program and this year's NOFO before we go further into the panel discussion with our great presenters that are joining us today. So I'm just gonna do some high level overview so everyone can get an idea of what's in the NOFO this year um, and what they should be looking for if they're interested in applying. So a little bit of background on the NOFO and what is the continuum of care and how it is structured with HUD. Next slide, please. Um, so the goal with this funding with the continuum of care is that communities work together um, to promote community-wide um, efforts to end homelessness. So uh, there is funding streams that are provided through nonprofits and state and local governments that help to um, rehouse individuals and families who are experiencing homelessness and the trauma of homelessness. So the goal of um, the continuum of care is to organize those efforts and to have a community-wide effort so they're streamlined and um, accessible and people are familiar and know where the funding and the housing availability is. So really um, the goal of the program is to quickly rehouse people and that includes um, survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault and human trafficking. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, continuums of care and also your balance of state at the state level, they serve as the governance structures for the homelessness services program. So they're official bodies that work with um, nonprofits and entities to structure your um, homelessness response. So they apply for the funds. So you would work if you're interested as an individual nonprofit applying for these funds, you would work with your continuum of care and people in your community to apply for those funds. And then that continuum of care manages and disperses the federal um, funding to the entities um, that are providing the housing in communities. They also provide a role of monitoring and evaluating grantees' performances. Um, there's also a role of you know, capacity and supporting programs so they know what's required uh, of the funding streams. Um, and often there's various committees um, based on different uh, requirements in the NOFO that, um, that are established and they come up with written standards and policies and procedures within communities for providing the homelessness assistance. Um, there's also people involved that manage pieces on reporting that include um, data management um, through either a comparable database, if you're a victim service provider that gets folk of our FIPSA funding, or if you're a mainstream homeless service provider, you would be entering data into the homelessness management information system. They also provide a coordinating role around um, access through the housing through coordinated entry, and that looks at a variety of ways in various communities. We could do a whole training on coordinated entry. Um, HUD had one earlier this week on um, coordinated entry and um, fair housing and racial equity. So that was super helpful. So um, they're really the community hub and the organization that supports you as a service provider, victim service provider, or culture specific provider to apply for these funds and to be able to work um, with individuals and families and survivors that are coming to you for housing resources. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we've been encouraging this for a long time, but we really want um, continuums of care and victim service agencies and, and culturally specific agencies to work very closely together. You're in community together, you're aware of the issues, you're trying to address the issues and be responsive to people experiencing homelessness in your community. So uh, we love it when we see cross-pollination around um, two-way board membership. So um, I, I spoke to someone today at a state domestic violence coalition that's the board chair of their balance of state. So they're very familiar with what's happening in their state. Um, and then often we see homelessness providers or continuum of care leadership also um, providing leadership or support or serving on board uh, on the boards of directors of domestic and sexual violence agencies. Um, there's also opportunities for staff and leadership at um, victim service agencies to serve on committees and, and do various roles around, say, for example, coordinated entry or data, things like that. Um, and over the years, since the DB bonus fund, since 2018, we've just seen a lot of increase in these partnerships and just really um, robust responses to uh, homelessness as it impacts domestic and sexual violence survivors. Um, there's also a lot of cross-training that happens um, within these organizations, like how to best serve survivors um, who are experiencing homelessness, if they're coming to the mainstream homeless system, or if there are people that are coming to DV agencies that might be a better fit for mainstream homeless services. There's a lot of cross-training, cross-referrals, and support that are, that are happening ideally in communities. Um, and then there's um, also additional funding now um, since 2018 for the DVSA bonus funds. And then uh, in the last year, um, there is eligibility for tribal nations. They may now also apply for continuum of care funds um, uh, with the HUD NOFO. Next slide, please. Um, so a little bit of overview, just kind of nuts and bolts of what is in the NOFO, what are the changes. Um, so fortunately, there's been an increase, about a 10, 11% increase in NOFO funding. So we're talking about over $3 billion, with a B, billion dollars uh, to address homelessness in our country. As we know, um, there's still scarcity around this funding, um, but we're always trying to get additional increases to be able to meet the demand for services and the request for housing as we have an affordable housing crisis in our country. So we have an increase in funding in this year's NOFO, which is great. So there'll be more 
money um, available for people to apply for. And then also as since the inception in 2018, there's $52 million for the domestic violence, sexual assault and human trafficking bonus fund. So we're really excited that that money has continued to be appropriated and that the federal government sees a need for survivors to have a specific set aside for funds um, within the, the HUD NOFO. So there's a number of HUD homeless policy priorities that they're looking at in this year's NOFO. So when you're applying, you want to be thinking about this and um, addressing this in your NOFO and within um, your continuum of care when you're reaching out to them to inquire about applying or partnering. Um, these are the things you want to be um, looking at. They, the policy priorities include ending homelessness for all persons, which is a value we all can get behind. Um, using a housing first approach. And so many of us in the field are using the housing first approach. And for uh, victim service providers, uh, we have a research and efficacy base now. There's a lot of great research that has come out around how effective the DV housing first model is. Um, and we have great research um, from the Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence and their work with um, the Michigan State researchers around that model and how effective it is. So you have that um, to be able to include in your application that it does work. Um, they're always looking at improving system performance measures, which include keeping people housed and finding permanent housing. Um, they're looking for partnerships across systems and that's looking for partnerships with housing, permanent housing, health, and, and, and different service agencies. Um, and again, um, as with as it was last year, the HUD is looking to center racial equity and make sure that we're addressing racial equity as people of color and communities of color, particularly Black, African American, and Latino are um, disproportionately impacted by racism. So we're looking at um, addressing that um, within this funding stream. Um, also improving assistance to LGBTQ individuals as they also are disproportionately impacted by housing discrimination um, in, in services and in, in, and in housing generally. Um, they're centering the experiences of people with lived expertise within your agencies and organizations, having a voice there, um, setting the agenda. And then um, there's also a tie-in around increasing affordable housing supply as we can't end homelessness in our communities if we also are not looking at building additional housing to, um, to safely and stably house people once they are transitioning out of their homelessness um, programs that they've been receiving services from. All right, I'm gonna try to do this a little quicker because we've got a lot to cover with the panelists. Um, the next slide, please. Um, so just a quick overview again, the, the um, the goals, strategic goals um, for HUD for this NOFO is to support underserved communities, ensuring access and increasing production of affordable housing. So whatever partnerships and work you can do to um, increase uh, affordable housing in your communities um, will be uh, looked upon favorably in this application. They're also looking at promoting home ownership opportunities and equitable access to credit to purchase um, and also for home improvements and to continue and to increase wealth building in underserved communities. And they're also looking to uh, advance uh, sustainable communities. And so they're looking at the intersection around climate resiliency and um, safe homes as, a, as, a, as it relates to climate energy efficiency and promoting environmental justice and, and recognizing that um, a healthy home is also a safe home as well. Uh, next slide, please. And there's a few project types um, that you can apply for with this NOFO. Um, and so I'm not going to go into all the different types into detail, but they're in the NOFO. But really quickly, it's um, they're looking at permanent housing, which includes the rapid rehousing, housing first model, permanent supportive housing. Um, there is still transitional housing in the mix. So if you've received that, as many domestic violence providers offer transitional housing that is um, available as a renewal fund only, no new projects. Um, there is the joint transitional housing, rapid rehousing component project that we've seen be very effective with the DVSA bonus funds. Um, there's also uh, planning and, and services, supportive services money with the coordinated entry projects. And then there's also um, funding for HMIS and comparable database to collect the data and be able to do the reporting and the system performance measures that are required 
with the NOFO. Um, the next slide um, is just a note on the definition. Um, so there is an amendment to qualifying for homelessness um, as it relates to domestic and sexual violence. There was a change in the Violence Against Women Act in 2022. Um, it hasn't been pro promulgated by HUD yet. That's a fancy word I can't really say. Um, so there's still guidance um, that needs to be uh, taken into effect in rulemaking that needs to be made with uh, continuums of care. But um, there's the VAWA definition as written from VAWA 22 is um, the the fleeing or attempting to flee for the domestic or sexual violence is that it's any life threatening condition related to violence against the individual or family member um, as it relates to their family's current housing situation, including where the health and safety of children are jeopardized um, and they have no other safe residence and they lack the resources to obtain other permanent uh, safe housing. So there's a change there. And then um, another next slide on additional NOFO changes. There are also continuum of care planning increases. Um, HUD has established an alternative maximum amount for continuum of care planning um, under this NOFO. It used to be capped, so you have more planning dollars if you want to be working on partnerships and trying to, um, you know, be responsive to homelessness in your community, there's planning dollars to do that. Um, there's new eligible continuum of care activities. There is a Violence Against Women Act cost budget line item um, for that. And there's also rural costs as well that are eligible. And then I mentioned this before, um, tribal nations may also apply for continuum of care funding and tribes and tribally designated housing entities can also be collaborative app, applicants or, or operate as a continuum of care. Um, and then the amended definition on, on survivors. Um, next slide, please. Um, all right, so just some great news that's happening at the federal level. Some really wonderful work has been happening with a lot of leaders in the um, anti-violence um, and homelessness field. There has been a lot of input um, that was gathered from the field from the US Interagency Council on Homelessness. And they recently published a federal strategic plan to end homelessness. And it is a multi-year agency roadmap um, that is gonna set the, the, the way for us to think about how we wanna um, address and end homelessness in our communities and in our country. So I encourage you all to take a look at that if you're applying for these funds and working with your continuum of care. Um, as it, it really speaks to um, where the federal government and federal agencies are headed and where we are headed as a field. And then I also just wanted to make a note for those that aren't um, aware, um, we do have some positive, amazing changes in, at the federal level. We now have a, a director on gender-based violence and equity in, HUD's, in the HUD secretary office, Carlo Ng. Um, they have a lot of experience in the field working directly and litigating and doing a lot of housing justice work. So they're very familiar with um, survivor gender-based violence um, housing work um, and have a lot of expertise and have been very beneficial to, to survivor-centered um, work in our field and centering racial equity. So they're at the secretary's office. And then we had the recent swearing in of Rosie Hidalgo um, as the director of the violence Office on Violence Against Women. And they have so many years of expertise on uh, working with survivors and providing leadership in our field. And, and we're lucky to have them both um, at the Office of Violence Against Women and at HUD. The last thing I want to mention before I'm going to pass it off to our fabulous speakers is there is a HUD website that I want you all to visit called hud.gov backslash VAWA. A lot of information there, a compilation of resources around the Violence Against Women Act and how um, HUD is implementing that. There's also a place for survivors if they're experiencing um, housing discrimination as it relates to their survivorship, they can also file a complaint on the FHEO Fair Housing and Equity Office website there. And we also published a document recently that, provide a guide, that provides guidance on how you as an advocate or, um, uh, or a survivor can um, uh, activate your housing rights if you're being discriminated in 
federally covered housing programs. Um, it doesn't apply for private housing programs, but still a great resource and great work being done with our partners at HUD. And at this point, I'm going to pass it over, I believe, to our um, NIDB coalition members at the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Domestic Violence. They really are leaders in the field and have paved the way um, of applying for these HUD DV bonus funds and um, supporting their member programs. And I just, um, my hat's off to them and all their great work. And I can't wait to hear more about the work that they're doing. So I'm gonna pass it over to you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve Fox, for that beautiful overview of the HUD um, NOFO process and specifically pertaining to domestic violence and sexual assault providers um, who are doing um, major work on the ground each and every day um, to support survivors and um, to, to really um, utilize these funds that are, are possible and attainable um, through you know, federal funding. Um, as DeFox had mentioned, I'm going to introduce our um, illustrious panelists for today. Um, starting with myself, um, your moderator, um, I like to say I have expertise in survivor autonomy. And what that means is really um, giving more of the control and decision making um, to the population that you are serving, um, in this case for survivors of domestic violence, incorporating their own sense of choice their, um, and incorporating their goals, their housing journey goals, and um, really um, giving more, more self-determination um, back to the survivor community or to, to any community that's um, looking for some types of autonomy, um, especially in situations where a lot of the uh, control had been um, decreased or taken away in some form or fashion. Um, and uh, with us today, we have Maria Williams, who is the Director of Housing this is all um, the, the following people I'm going to read is at the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Domestic Violence. We have Alexandra Cantrell, who is our Housing Advocacy and Policy Manager. Tara Ulrich, who is the Housing Advocacy Specialist. Thank you so much, um, PCADV, for joining us. And um, they've also brought some wonderful um, service providers um, out in Pennsylvania um, from Turning Point of Lehigh Valley and Arise. Uh, first off with Turning Point of Lehigh Valley, we have Lori Sawinski, who is the Executive Director, and Kanoa Askernice, who is the Transitional Housing Director, um, both over at Turning Point of Lehigh Valley. And with us from Arise is Nicole Amable from the uh, from Arise, who is our executive director there, and Erin Brand, who is the director of residential services. Welcome everyone to, um, to our panel. And I just want to um, ask Mary Kate to um, pull down our slides for today and spotlight our um, panelists. Um, thank you so much, um, everyone, for joining us on this, on, on this really important roundtable conversation. Um, I want to encourage, again, everyone to stay informed, stay engaged um, in the chat, um, talk to each other. If you have any questions, please refer to the Q&A model. We have designated some time at the end specifically for answering questions, as we mentioned before. And we also want to um, like answer questions in real time and engage with, um, with, with the panelists here today. Um, I want to just also preface that you should be following these um, these organizations on their social media. Please feel free to take a look um, at their websites. They're really um, impactful organizations. And first, I'm going to give the floor to um, some specific people, but please hop in if you'd like to add any um, any more content on any of the questions today. Um, if you can tell us, tell us a little bit about your organization and your program model, um, Maria, Nicole, or Lori, um, whoever wants to go first, please tell us a little about your organization and your program model. Well, I'm happy to get us kicked off. Um, so 
the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Domestic Violence is the, the state designated um, domestic violence coalition in Pennsylvania. And we have uh, member programs that represent every county in the state. It's a large state. And so we have um, nearly 60 member programs. And um, we've featured two of our member programs <clears throat> who are doing just outstanding work with uh, rapid rehousing funds. Um, as a coalition, we really work at the, um, the direction of our membership. And um, when we started doing housing work at PCADV formally five years ago, it was at the direction of member programs saying we can't do this on our own. It was very fortunate that that coincided with the first DV bonus opportunity. So um, PCDV was the applicant on behalf of the Eastern and Western Continuums of Care um, for rapid rehousing. We've been awarded every year since, and now we have um, nearly $9 million in the balance of state. I think that's correct. Um, and it's very exciting. It, what is also, I think, mind-blowing is that it doesn't meet the need. Um, and the need is ever increasing. This is the sort of thing that I think many of you have found. And I know that our friends from New Jersey and Iowa and Texas and Washington are all on the call and you all have been doing this work for a long time too. So there's a lot of, of, of knowledge um, just with the attendees also. So the more that we all can contribute, the better. I think in Pennsylvania though, specifically what we're seeing is that the more resources there are for DV survivors, the more willing DV survivors are to engage in the system. And so if there actually seems like there's an answer for survivors, um, I think they show up in different ways. Um, we've really prioritized um, implementing the DV Housing First model officially, I guess, in um, the Balance of State and the East and West Continuums of Care. Um, the providers in, in the, the East and West Continuums of Care have been practicing Housing First, um, likely since they opened their doors. It had nothing to do with the implementation of uh, the DV bonus funds. This is just their orientation to service and the way that they believe survivors should be heard and centered in their work and in their lives. The other thing that we know about these predominantly rural communities is that they are led by survivors, they are run by survivors on the board, they're um, survivors at sort of every level of decision making. And I think that that's more common in rural areas than it is um, in other places that I've experienced um, because the community is so tight and everyone knows each other and everyone is reliant on each other in some way. And so where we're really looking now is looking at a community response to domestic violence that for these smaller rural providers, it's it's nearly impossible to say that all DV survivors in that county are going to go to that provider and receive the housing assistance that they need. It's just not practical. So in this year's NOFO application, what we're really looking at is how do we talk about ending domestic violence homelessness as a community response rather than as the domestic violence provider's response. Um, so I think that that's really exciting, and I think that there's a lot of opportunity to engage moving forward. Um, we're, we're so grateful to be able to do the work that we do, um, and so, so grateful to be able to partner with our member programs. So with that, I'll turn it over to Lori or Nicole. Do you want to, I can go next. I thought Lori and I both took ourselves off the mute at the same time. So I'm Nicole Amabile. I'm the executive director at Arise Lawrence County. Um, Arise is um, located in Lawrence County, which is in the western part of Pennsylvania, and we are a very rural county. We are a comprehensive crime victim service agency um, with uh, 42 years of service to our community. So we have advocacy, counseling, emergency shelter, hotline, prevention, education, all of those services. But we actually opened our door as an organization 42 years ago as an emergency shelter. We do operate two COC funded housing programs. We have a joint transitional housing, rapid rehousing um, component project, which initially began as transitional housing back in 2001 and is now the joint component project. And then we have another rapid rehousing um, project that is funded through um, PCADV's application in our COC. Last year, we were able to provide 
um, 48 households assistance with these, um, these uh, uh, COC funded programs, which is really exciting for our county. And um, with PCADV um, helping the domestic violence centers across the state of Pennsylvania um, with these housing programs, we've been able to grow our program exponentially and have a lot of growth in the, in the future in terms of being able to house um, domestic violence survivors in permanent housing situations. So that has been um, really exciting for us. And I just, um, you know, while I have the floor, so to speak, want to talk just a little bit um, about the difference between um, the joint component program that we have, um, where we are the primary primary applicant um, through the COC versus the rapid rehousing um, project that PCADV has been able to help us um, to secure. I just want to say um, for those of you who, who come from smaller centers, I think that you understand the administrative burden of, of managing any grant. And I, I feel like the administrative burden of managing a HUD grant through a COC program um, is very extensive and it takes a lot of time to go through the NOFO to prepare an application, even if it's just a renewal application, to understand the HUD priorities and the COC policies, to you know, comb through data, all of that stuff. And while we've been doing it as an organization for only over 20 years, having PCADV really step up to the plate and manage that application for the state has really allowed us to expand our housing programs and our capacity to do that in a way that we would have never been able to do as a small um, rural organization. We'll turn it over to you, Lori. Thanks, Nicole. And I'm so happy to be here and watching all these states fly by, like what a small country we are. Um, and so I was trying to think about like similarities here and as we talk, and I know Maria was referring to us as small and rural, and I would say, you know, in Pennsylvania, what's a bit unique here is that we have 67 counties um, and we're sort of like in the middle, everyone's in the middle of Philly and Pittsburgh, right? So you have these major metro areas. The Lehigh Valley, which is the two county region that I and Kanoa are living in, is um, the third biggest metro area. So while we kind of fall into that small fish pond, we're kind of the big fish there, right? And so it's been this interesting dynamic. When we talk about balance of state, they have the continuum of cares. Like some people are their own continuum for a single county region. And then there's a bunch of us. We have 32 counties that are part of our balance of state continuum. I think that's the right number. So I mean, it's like this weird dynamic where it's supposed to improve efficiencies, but what it's led to is a lot of bureaucracy. So I've been doing the work here at Turning Point. I've been the executive director here for almost eight years. Um, full disclosure, I started my career in victim services back in the 90s. I'm here again, but in the middle did grant management. And I can appreciate, I managed HUD funds and I swore I'd never take them here at Turning Point, because again, I know how hard it was and how many times I was in the role of having to recapture money, including from my own program here. So we serve domestic and intimate partner abuse survivors and their families only. We are comprehensive. We serve about 3,500 people a year in a metro area of about 600,000. About 350 people a year get shelter through us. And we knew we had this significant demand for housing, but I was really conscious of the fact that this program back in the early, up until about 2012, had a transitional housing program. And it was the traditional brick and mortar. We staffed it. We had eight families at a time. And financially, when HUD changed policy, and because so much was invested in the building, we had to sell it and evict all of our residents. And it came with all of the challenges. So we knew we had to address the housing issue, but I was so concerned about the bureaucratic drain it could be on our staff and we only have 35 people in total and the first year dv bonus came out like i was approached and even having served as president of a continuum and managed hud grants i couldn't figure out how to get it together in time i just didn't have that big of a capacity so i want to echo the whole role of the coalition because in the second year we did get it in the dv bonus and that has been a game changer in terms of our ability to house survivors and have them not stay for extensively long periods at our shelter so just wanted to kind of throw that out there as a preface. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Lori, Nicole, and Maria um, for introducing your organizations. Um, I wanted to um, say that you all really went over our icebreaker question, which was for today. Um, you um, let me um, 
take away the trouble from having to ask. I will ask anyway and ask if anyone else would like to chime in here. And really, um, we're here really to demystify what the DV NOFO um, funding process is and what, why, why do we want to participate? Why do we want to encourage other maybe smaller um, community-based organizations or culturally specific organizations um, to tap into these funds? And with that, um, all this increasing access to funding, uh, D. Fox earlier talked about the set aside of $52 million um, and really expanding on equitable practices. Um, does anyone else have other insights related to the hesitancy for culturally specific or small or rural or grassroots organizations to, to apply? And I'm um, opening it up here um, for federally recognized tribes or um, tribal organizations. Anyone here in the chat as well? Um, is there any hesitancy that you're seeing um, in your communities on, you know, just applying for funds? Charlena, I think I saw somebody in the chat say that they wanted to speak. You are correct. I do see somebody in the chat saying that they would like to speak. Um, we do have a Q&A session at the end of our um, panel discussions where we would love for you to hold your questions and hold your responses. We really want um, engagement. Please, um, if you if you don't, don't mind um, putting any engagement in the chat and also in our Q&A feature um, here. Uh, I wanna um, give the floor to our panelists, any other types of um, hesitancy that you're seeing in communities? Why is it that, um, you know, there is it more awareness or, you know, just um, trying to get others to tap into to these pots? Well, I can. I'll go ahead. I was just going to say, from from a, a domestic violence perspective, I think that like one of the most challenging things that we've seen over the last five years is that domestic violence organizations are they serve DV survivors and housing has always been a part of that, but it hasn't been the center of it. And COC funds are are usually given to organizations where housing is what they do. And so we're now organizationally trying to create this bridge that um, will allow domestic violence organizations, some suburban mid-sized organizations, some small organizations to really engage in a way that allows them to continue to do what they're best at, which is serving survivors, and let the coalition deal with all of the nonsense that HUD wants to put you through. And so I think that um, replicating that model in communities where you have small grassroots providers, culturally specific providers is really, really um, impactful because it takes away the burden of administration and fund management and that sort of thing and allows organizations to really do what they're best at. And Maria, if I could add to that, I think, you know, the capacity of the grant writing, the APRs, the comparable database, you've taken that lift off of us. Uh, but again, it, we can talk a little bit about some of that stuff. But I would say what it's also done is we have to have a capacity locally to manage it. So there is some amount of bureaucracy, which, you know, in terms of maintaining client files and making sure you're compliant. Uh, but there's also interacting with your COC and dealing with our coordinated entry system. And I don't know, Kanoa, I mean, if you want to talk a little bit about sort of what that involves on your end, but I think the ability to hire people. So over time, as we've increased funds, Kanoa has now sort of been elevated into a role of transitional housing director and allow, now has a team of people, but which frees her up to do a lot of the stuff you have to do locally if you really want to be able to help. And I don't know, Kanoa, you can speak to the engagement piece a little bit. Yeah, I think um, building a, a really solid relationship with your regional manager through the COC um, for us has been very instrumental in us being able to just check on the statuses of information on the BNL, which we don't have direct access to. Um, and that is the database that we, that providers or 
our individuals are provided to us from. So that has been very instrumental in us being able to just roll people into the program and just keep those connections um, with other providers as well. Um, so yeah, that community connection is really important all the way around. And I just wanna um, add to this, uh, at Arise, we're in a unique position because we actually have an MOU through our COC to provide coordinated entry support to other domestic violence programs. Um, so really helping those programs to understand the coordinated assessment process, how to get folks on the list, how to pull from that list to um, uh, fill you know, their housing programs. And I would say one of the things that the coordinated entry specialists that work um, at our organization um, have noticed when they're going out to the Western domestic violence, the Western um, PA domestic violence program is that there is a lot of confusion really about what the COC is and what it's not and, and how you can connect into it and, and how, you know, attending COC facilitated meetings on coordinated entry and just general meetings can be um, helpful. And so I think that just sort of demystifying that whole um, uh, idea of what a COC is and, and how it functions in relation to um, individual programs can be um, very helpful. Um, I've been with our organization at Arise for over 16 years. And when I stepped um, into the role, role of executive director here, knowing that we had the COC funded programs, that they were growing. We, you know, we had this MOU to do this coordinated assessment work. Like my first priority was, you know, how do I get on the COC board and how do I stay connected into what's going on? Um, because it has been really instrumental for me in terms of understanding, you know, policies and priorities, understanding just HUD as a funder a little bit better. Um, and it has really then given um, me the opportunity to be the voice for domestic violence survivors in spaces where maybe their voice, you know, wasn't um, being represented. And I'm not saying that everyone should go out and try to join the board. I'm saying all of this to say that I think that there is um, a lot of confusion about what a COC is and how it operates um, in relationship to HUD and to then to the individual programs that receive this funding. And that by plugging in in whatever way makes sense for you as an individual or an organization um, can be really helpful. Thank you, everyone. And thank you so much for um, um, please inserting your um, engagement in the chat. Um, our next question is for Alex, Tara, Kanoa, or Aaron. Um, especially in this age of remote, hybrid, in-person, like kind of collaborative work as the norm, um, one of the things that we want to emphasize with is that service providers can use HUD funding to build out your organizational capacity. And we talked I, I've seen there's a few people who already um, shared their thoughts on this, um, but can we dive in a little bit more to explain some creative ways you may have used NOFO funding um, with any housing subsidy to really increase your agency's bandwidth? And um, this can apply to your housing practices or on, on a coalition level. Um, what are some ways the DV HUD NOFO dollars has really helped to increase that organizational capacity and bandwidth. I can speak specifically to the increased capacity at the coalition level. And so as Maria had mentioned, and I think it's been mentioned a bunch of times um, today on the panel, is that PCDV applies for um, these funds on behalf of our member agencies. And you know they um, ultimately are our subrecipients. But there has also been a large investment in capacity building at the coalition level. 
And so one of those areas, and I noticed a couple of the pieces that folks threw in the chat related to confidentiality and reporting requirements is a large area that we've really invested in, in terms of the coalition's capacity to be able to um, over um, oversee the data entry, to help support data entry, to help identify what um, comparable database would work best for our community. That's a big piece, like really identifying what will work best for our subrecipients, make it as easy as possible, because we know that HUD reporting requirements are, um, you know, difficult and they're, they look different than other funding streams in many cases. And so making sure that we're not adding too much additional burden to programs in terms of data entry, and also providing that additional support um, that a software developer may not be able to provide, or there may just be a disconnect as it relates to like how you're entering the data rather than just the technical pieces in the back end. And so um, that's really one of the areas that we've tried to focus on in terms of supporting programs to not only be able to collect the information they need to, enter the information they need to, and also ultimately score well within the scoring process in the COC. Um, but also taking on that entire uh, reporting burden. And so being able to then run those APRs and pull those reports when necessary, um, rather than programs having to take their day to do that. So that's one of the areas that um, we've increased capacity at the coalition. Um, additionally, two other pieces, and I want to make sure the other um, panelists are able to, to chat about their increased capacity, but um, two of the other areas that we've really made sure to add capacity at the coalition level directs relately to the issues and the barriers that we've seen programs encounter. And so one of those specifically is community engagement, identification of landlords and trying to build those relationships and providing a direct staff person at the coalition to help support those efforts at the community level. And we have identified that one of the largest barriers that exists for the spending of rapid rehousing specifically is identification of housing, affordable housing specifically. And so that's one of the areas we're really focusing on moving forward is helping to support landlord engagement and relationships at that community level, um, you know, with a new staff person at the coalition. But I'll pass it over to my other panelists as well. Hi, I, um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the other ways we're encouraging programs to kind of build out their supportive service budgets in order to build capacity. Um, so uh, one of the ways is uh, talking to our programs about really looking at the need for uh, housing location services. And we have been very fortunate to, as Maria said, get um, awarded more money year after year in the DV bonus. Um, and now, uh, you know, programs have all this money and they have survivors that need housing, but it's finding the units. So encouraging uh, programs to build out that kind of capacity, um, as well as, and I know Kanoa can probably speak to this a little bit more from the boots on the ground, but really encouraging um, programs to do what they can do to make their advocates as mobile as possible um, and to, you know, allow uh, you know, advocates to work in the field or a hybrid schedule or a flexible schedule that really meets the needs of both uh, the advocates, you know, having their own lives and, and practicing self-care as well as, you know, survivors' lives don't happen on a nine to five schedule. Survivors' lives don't happen um, only in the office. So, you know, we always say DV housing advocacy shouldn't take place all the time in your office unless that's what the survivor wants to do. So we've really been incre uh, encouraging programs to in increase capacity there. And I'll let Kanoa talk more about what that looks like for her and her agency. Yeah, so we use the term as mobile advocacy, um, you know, just meeting people where they are, um, you know, and that could be, I know I've, I've met personally someone in a dental office um, while their child was, you know, getting their, their services done and we were filling out paperwork, you know, um, but it was what they needed, you know, so we, we go the length of, you know, what they need and, and really cater the service around, um, you know, their individualized needs, so. And just to piggyback on it from a budget perspective, if I can say what has been helpful in allowing people to do the mobile advocacy has been able to add additional positions at full cost plus the technology they need. So we've gone, thanks to the pandemic, primarily paperless. So the technology to just be able to access client files. So everyone has tablets and cell phones so they can travel safely. I mean, so all of that stuff, you have that opportunity to build in your budget through the DV bonus money. And once you get that every year, it continues. So it's just something to think about. 
you know, the other thing we've really, um, we've encouraged programs to do is especially our rural programs where, you know, advocates are having to travel across large counties. I know we talk about in Western PA all the time, it takes 45 minutes to get anywhere in Western PA, it feels like. So like encouraging programs, if you have it, if you're able to, you know, buying a vehicle for your agency, for advocates to use to transport survivors to, you know, go view apartments or go look at housing units and things like that. Um, building out transportation budgets to pay your advocates in mileage if they are having to use their own vehicles and things like that. So um, for our program, one of the things I love that Kanoa um, said that if they do mobile advocacy, but for me and for our department and um, overseeing the programs that we have at Arise um, in our rapid rehousing and our transitional housing and also our emergency shelter, for me, I say this term all the time to, um, my, to our team. I like to call it good case management, like real boots to the ground case management. And to be quite honest, if you're going to have a successful program, you really need to be able to meet survivors where they are. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, they they just they need that extra support from us. A lot of them don't know how to navigate the process of document readiness. What do I do? I I, I have to leave. How am I going to find a place to live? How am I going to support my children? How are we going to handle these custody issues? And I I want to be safe, but I also can't be homeless. And so um, what I really love about what Arise is doing is we are trying um, to make sure that we use use the funds that come through the NOFO for our supportive services. Um, and those supportive services, I think, are so key to be able to take to address those barriers that people have that would prevent them from getting into housing. Like, how am I going to pay for a rental application? I, I just left with the clothes on my back. Or I, and when I left with the clothes on my back, I left my wallet behind. And that has my driver's license. That that also has my birth certificates. I can't, I can't get into housing if I don't have that. I had to quit my job. How am I going to find a place to work? So in those case management moments, our team is able to try to identify some of those barriers to be able to walk alongside a survivor and say, hey, I'm going to work. Um, Maria used the word braided today. I think I'm going to use that for the rest of my life. I love that. Um, but we were, we're also able to braid our services with other community providers if the survivor is willing to do so. Um, we have to have consent, but we're able to work with them to make sure that we can connect them to the services that they need. Um, and we really do have that boots to the ground mentality. Tomorrow, our whole housing team is going to um, a housing inspection to use the HQS quality standards to do the inspection and to do the lease. And we've got some new case managers that are learning how um, to make sure that we can ensure a survivor is able to get into a place. Um, and that's that's the things, those are some of the things we do. I mean, we make sure we meet the client where they are. It also has to be client driven. I mean, we don't want to push anyone into anything, but we want to be there to support them. Um, and then some of the other creative ways that um, I think that Arise is really blessed is um, because of all the hard work of people even, like um, Nicole's been with the agency for 16 years, but there were a lot of funding mothers that um, really wanted to address uh, domestic violence in a whole because the way that people were treated um, whenever there was a domestic violence situation, they were put into jail. Um, and so this group of women decided that they were going to stand up and they would actually sit, they got, they would sit on the porch of the place that they were providing to not let anybody come in to affect that family. But with that, all of that hard work and all of that time putting into the NOFO prep and into the work that came with building these programs, Arise also has opportunities to do mobile advocacy with court accompaniment. Um, and also uh, we're, we respond um, to sexual assault call outs at our hospital. Um, so we do all of those things because 
we're able to have those services from HUD. Thank you so much, everyone, for your feedback on that. Um, moving right along to our next question. Um, and we touched upon this a little bit earlier. Um, just wondering, um, either PCADV, um, Kanoa, or Erin, if you want to briefly chime in on some of the housing initiatives or preventative, or preventative models, whether it's past, present, or future, um, have been incorporated to decrease housing barriers for survivors and influence housing stability. Um, that in some cases they might not be adequately articulated or calculated or are considered non-traditional or you don't realize you need the funds until you need the funds. Um, how has HUD-based funding really helped overcome um, some of those barriers? I know um, we touched a little bit about um, landlord, landlord engagement earlier. Um, we can also discuss um, language accessibility um, and interpretation costs. Of course, the meaningful inclusion of survivors into your work and into your initiatives um, that's really going to help in um, influence systems change. Um, what are some of the housing initiatives that um, are used to really decrease those barriers for survivors and influence housing stability? I know for us, um, being able to use an interpreter service to, you know, speak to anyone um, at any, you know, given time um, has been very instrumental um, and also interpreting our documents um, so that, you know, it's in the language that someone, you know, actually can read rather than just reading off, um, you know, the information with the interpreter. Um, and with those documents, not just being, you know, procedural things, um, you know, interpreting goal plans and, um, you know, even creating a, a document that may be of uh, benefit to someone. Um, I have a survivor who, um, you know, is, is undocumented and has never worked. Um, so is, you know, working under the table and, you know, has never had to keep track of income. Um, so we created a document where she can actually, or they can actually, um, you know, document their, their hours worked and, you know, the money that they are being paid every day. So it's a way for us to track that and then, you know, work towards sustainability um, and, and just, you know, implementing that and just giving her the tools to, you know, do what she's going to need to do to sustain that once our services are done. So that's been a good thing for us. I don't want to monopolize, but, and again, Kanoa is fabulous. So I will keep putting her on the spot, but I think, you know, we talk about survivor engagement and I know we've talked about this a little bit, how so much of our movement, maybe unlike the housing movement, which in a lot of ways is driven by policy, but I think the victim services movement in general has been so survivor driven. A lot of time it is, you know, again, grassroots, primarily women helping women in the beginning and survivors helping survivors. So I think there's a whole lot that can be said there, but I think one of the things Kanoa's was really taking the time to do is engage a whole lot of meaningful ways. So we have a standardized assessment that every VOCA funded agency in Pennsylvania uses the ESQ. So I know we're utilizing that for survivors in our housing program, but you've also developed Kanoa like different types of ways of engaging and checking in with people at intervals. And you've created sort of a survey that you're completing in addition to that, um, you know, sort of celebrating people when they graduate off the program and then inviting them to be mentors within our agency, which is, again, sort of a cross be hybrid between volunteering and sort of speaking about your own experience if that's something you want to do. So you're an inspiration to others. So I think Kano has been really great. And I don't know if you want to add anything to that, though, to really make sure we're we designed the program, but we're always sort of looking to fail fast, right? If we've implemented something that sounded good on paper, but it's not working for survivors, how do we test that and make sure we're incorporating their feedback and then changing it and not getting really hung up on HUD and what they want, but rather what does a survivor need? 
Yeah, absolutely. That, that last part, um, really taking, you know, those, the, the feedback that we get from our exit interviews, which are, you know, really ask for that feedback, that honest feedback on, you know, what you thought, you know, could have been better. What do you think, you know, we could implement that uh, would benefit, would have benefited you or would benefit someone else coming on to the program. So, you know, definitely looking for that insight and feedback from the people that we're working with. I'll just speak real quickly. I know um, I'm, Aaron had a bad connection. She just messaged me and we somehow lost her. But one of the initiatives that we're working on is to create a peer support network. So um, folks who have, um, you know, made it through the, the housing process, who are, you know, um, at a good place in their healing jersey journey, who are stabilized and really want to work with the agency to volunteer and give back. Um, we're beginning to, um, to start to, to form a peer group where if we have um, someone who is going into um, rapid rehousing, who is just maybe um, struggling um, a little extra and wants to really connect with someone who can understand you know, where they are at that particular point in their life that we're able to connect those um, two people for some peer support outside of the case management services that we're, that we're offering. And we're still really in the early stages of getting that up and running, but it is something that has been very exciting and rewarding for program participants who have sort of been through the process and come out on a, the other side. And like I said, folks who are newer to the program who are just really struggling um, and want to connect with someone that has some of the same lived experiences that they do. Thank you so much. Um, and we'll look out for um, um, Aaron to join us back. Um, I do see a hand raised. Uh, we still have a few more questions to get through, and I want to make sure that we're covering all our bases today. Please make sure that you're um, putting your questions in the Q&A and also engaging in the chat. Um, and there is still some time left dedicated towards answering questions, which um, Collaborative Solutions, um, Elena, has been um, answering questions um, ongoing in the chat. So thank you so much um, for your help there. Um, and our next question, um, really want to level set that um, we're really talking about um, racial equity as a priority in the HUD DV NOFO. And I uh, just want to give uh, a, a, a sense of, you know, incorporating um, those who are really um, marginalized by um, different types of, you know, funding opportunities or, you know, just awareness of things that are available to them um, and give a little background um, about those who really what who, who, who this money is serving. Um, and nearly in every community, um, black and brown people of color, indigenous and tribal nations and other historically oppressed populations are substantially overrepresented in the homelessness population. HUD is emphasizing system and programmatic changes to address racial equity within continuums of care. Um, throughout your engagement with the coalition and your COCs, how has, race, how has centering racial equity practices played a role and demonstrated to uplift the grantee award process? And um, just to give um, more of a detailed um, you know, description of these populations as defined in the NOFO. Um, um, we we want to say Black, Latino, and Indigenous and Native American persons, Asian American persons, Pacific Islanders, and other persons of color. And um, earlier we mentioned other populations, um, members to include religious minorities, um, LGBTQ plus persons, persons who live in rural areas and with disabilities under the Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act and others adversely affected by persistent poverty or inequality. And I just wanna give reference to um, 
last week, I believe it was, July 6th was the 30, 33rd anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, this important civil rights law that pro prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities in all areas of public life, including jobs, schools, transportation, and all public and private places that are open to the general public. And of course, um, we want to mention that racial disparities not only affect housing, but they arise at every different juncture when it comes to um, oppressive, you know, systems, whether that's including the legal system, um, child welfare, health care, nutrition, public benefits, and many other intersections. Um, if you can please share a little bit about your racial equity actions plans, if you will, or um, engagements with other partners who are really um, experts in this work. Um, how, how, how do we fit racial equity into the uh, equation when it comes to the DB HUD NOFO and um, the application process? And that's for anyone. And also, I'm include. I'm I'm really um, asking for those um, here on the call today to engage and chat on this one because this is an ongoing conversation where we all can learn from each other. Please um, mention in the chat any thoughts that you might have in your community that you are using to tackle racial equity. Well, I guess I can mention. I mean, a few different things that I think. You know, we've talked a little bit partly at our coalition. I think we've actively have different caucuses for people with different identities. So they are actively engaged in the policy making work. And again, our member driven coalition really engages people in our housing policies. As a local level, I know some of the stuff we've talked about as we thought about this is again, we've partnered since the beginning with our legal service agency. So in our case, North Penn Legal, um, we have a grant we've helped them acquire. So they actually provide civil legal representation specifically for our clients around landlord and discrimination matters when they are dealing with that. They also have a fair housing effort um, that is county supported. So, you know, as it relates to some of the things about access to housing. So for people with disabilities, people being discriminated against based on nationality, um, race, ethnicity. I think that's something we've done. We've also partnered with some law firms to make sure we have specialized immigration assistance for people because we are home in the Lehigh Valley to a lot of people coming here as new citizens and sometimes not documented as Kanoa referenced. And again, really being able to get them the VAWA protections or help them access sort of the type of immigration assistance that people with lower incomes wouldn't otherwise be able to engage but a lot of this is the partnership. Like we have a ton of partnerships. So I think there's, you know, being part of our regional homeless advisory board, they just had a whole series of implicit biases trainings that were nine hours for housing providers. And that was one of many types of opportunities. And I think that we really prioritize and, you know, in addition to looking for those ways to actively have people engage in the service and provide us feedback. In Lawrence County, one of the challenges that we have, um, we our county is 92% white, um, and we just don't really have a lot of population specific services in Lawrence County um, uh, to partner with. So one of the things, um, and to add on top of that, I should say, we do have an emerging Latina community here in Lawrence County. And actually um, there was some research done that is showing that our Latino community, and I think the demographics of, of the county, we're gonna see a big shift in the next census, but is growing at more of a rapid pace than Allegheny County, like in the Pittsburgh area. So we do have like this need and this challenge in Lawrence County and just not really the, the um, the partners and the support to address it. So we actually hired a consultant um, and we were very um, uh, grateful to get some private funding to do that and, and formed a community stakeholder group who was able to identify um, some service gaps for this community to set some um, strategic um, goals. And then we were able to then work with um, some partners outside of our county to address some of those barriers and, and gaps to be able to better serve um, that particular population, you know, in our housing services. And we are seeing a positive response from that.
I think Thank that, you. Um, sorry, I was just going to chime in real quick. Um, I think that just um, representation within organizations as well um, is, a, is definitely helpful um, as an opportunity for individuals to connect with someone who, you know, speaks the same language, has the same religious background or, you know, just um, following. Um, I think that that can be very instrumental in just being able to provide, um, as Aaron said, good case management, right? Yeah, I'm here. I'm so sorry. I, I disappeared for a little bit. I, I'm so embarrassed too, but I'm here. I caught the case management part. So yes, Kanoa, yes. Thank you so much, Erin, for rejoining us. And in this age of tech, I'm glad you were able to get back on. Um, we were talking about some of the racial equity um, priorities that are happening in our communities and our continuums of care and um, how HUD is prioritizing racial equity principles along with other um, populations that have been marginalized in the process. Um, I think we all could benefit from um, continuing this types of conversations and um, how we can really cultivate community conversations together, specifically working in our own communities having these sorts of round tables on this very topic um, and really trying to you know, take away any types of tokenism or um, any types of oppressive natures that we might not be aware of that, um, that happen every day in our work. Um, and with that, I wanna, I wanna, I wanted to honor that we had set aside time at the end for our questions. Um, there are a few questions that I'm not able to talk about today. Um, please, at the end of this call, we want to continue the, um, this engagement and we want to um, invite any other, um, you know, any other questions we're not able to go over to kind of um, talk about it, um, you know, through email, through listserv or um, things of that nature. And we can always continue talking more, but um, just to um, to set us off for today, um, just want to talk a little bit about if if everyone here can give uh, two lines, really thirty seconds on um, what are some misconceptions when it comes to the uh, when it comes to this that you'd like to pass on to new applicants, challenges that you've seen in the field, um, and really just. Um, ending with a note of transparency, as I really feel like that theme of transparency has been prevalent today. Um, what what are some things that you want to give to new to new folks who are those culturally specific providers that um, are just looking into tapping into the NOFO? Um, any lessons learned? you'd like to share, and this is for everyone. Um, and this can include, like we said, reporting duties, site management, addressing gaps in the system, or um, in general, not only with the DV um, HUD bonus dollars, but in general, um, any types of guidance that you might give for applying for grants, please. Well, I would just uh, say from the the DV coalition perspective specifically, that it's our responsibility to show up for our member programs and culturally specific agencies that serve survivors. And um, PCDV is, has been uniquely positioned to do this work because we function as the FIPSA pass-through for the state. Um, so we have uh, a finance department and systems that are built, but you can also use HUD funds to build those systems. And we can't continue to hope that our member programs who do not have the capacity that we have are just going to figure it out, that it's our responsibility to step in and ask what they need and ask how we can support and go the extra mile to give that support in the same way that they they stress themselves to to serve survivors in the myriad of ways that survivors need support. I want to cheer for Maria because again, the PCTV, honestly, what, five years ago, none of this infrastructure existed at the coalition. So Maria came in, has been instrumental pushing the housing issue. And I think it sort of serves as a model for all the local programs. Um, their backbone 
support critical. So every coalition rep out there or program, go bug your coalition if you don't have this resource. Because I think that idea of having, you know, sort of that economy of scale at the state level to kind of deal with some of the bureaucracy, to free up all of our boots on the ground folks to do the hard work with survivors is really important. The other thing when you talk about misconceptions, Charlita, is kind of thinking about like we can ignore the housing thing as DV providers. We honestly cannot, you know, and I know during the pandemic, we saw when we had limited occupancy or had to space people out or had to limit housing and then everything got more expensive and we're in this recession. Like we have this confluence of issues where we have had consistently since July of 2020, more people, our shelters operated at somewhere between 100 and 350 percent capacity since July of 2020. We spent 400000 last year on hotels trying to house overflow. And part of that is because people are staying with us longer. It's so hard to get out of shelter once you come. So this idea of housing first, people are with us an average of 105 days now. Those are kids staying here in a shelter environment, which isn't ideal. So I think the idea that we can ignore housing as, or hope that the other traditional housing people are going to meet our needs, this is a way to kind of say, look, it hasn't happened yet, and it's going to be continuing to be a barrier. So I think this is a way, like, if you have the ability at all to spend some evenings or weekends, I know at the grant administration it's hard, but bite the bullet and just do it. Because I think that it really has helped so many survivors that otherwise wouldn't have these options. I think um, one of the challenges that our um, housing, our rapid rehousing program has um, experienced, um, and I, I feel like we are, you know, coming to the end of it, um, just with the work that we've been doing, um, you know, community um, connections and collaborating with um, different providers, especially like on our end, since we are, you know, we've only been doing this for about three years, um, you know, so we're like just coming into the game, you know, so connecting with providers who have already been in the system, um, working with landlords, we have, um, you know, worked with our Lehigh Valley or our regional homeless advisory board. Um, they have an actual um, landlord committee where different providers have come together and we are collectively creating a database for landlords um, so that we all can pull from that, right? It's not just, you know, we, you know, we have a, a landlord, you know, list that we work off of and we keep it to ourselves. Um, you know, we are providing and sharing that information with other providers because we're all in this together at the end of the day. You know, it's, we are specifically working with, you know, survivors, but, you know, we are all working with um, homelessness, you know, within our, our community. So that's been very, um, it's been a challenge. It was a challenge starting off, right? Having to create those relationships on our own, um, but then finding kind of our, our, our niche and um, being able to connect. And, you know, it's been very instrumental in us growing our ability, our capability to, um, our capacity rather to um, house more individuals. I just want to piggyback off of what Kano was talking about. That landlord engagement piece, I think, is a struggle at first, trying to find people that will, um, landlords that will rent to the populations we serve. Um, but I wrote down something that I wanted to share um, earlier about that landlord engagement piece is whenever we um, have the opportunity to talk to a landlord, I just kind of think it's our opportunity to do the best, like the like the greatest advocacy ever because the people that we serve are coming from horrific um, chapters in their lives. And we get to give, we get to advocate for them so that they can turn the page and rewrite their story. And, and so having those kind of thoughts and those kind of conversations with the landlord, I think is a way for um, us to be able to get them to understand that, hey, we're, we want to, we want to give this person an opportunity um, to have a second chance. And so that landlord engagement piece, yes, just learning how to find the right things to say to a landlord to get them on board. I think it, it also allows them the opportunity to come alongside of us, right? And, and be part of the work that we're doing. So that's, that's definitely something that 
um, our committee is definitely trying to get out and, you know, get the buy-in and, and just get them on board with, you know, the work that we're doing, that they are also doing, right? They're an extension of the work that we're doing by providing those opportunities. I think I just wanted to kind of piggyback off what Lori was saying, like if if you're hesitating about this um, and, and not sure if you should do it or not, to really think seriously about it and, and try to do it because there are programs out there who aren't oriented towards serving su survivors who are serving survivors with this money and perhaps and likely not in the way that we would hope survivors are being served. Um, so, you know, it's always best if, you know, DV programs can serve DV sur survivors, if culturally specific programs can serve those populations that, uh, that they're serving. So really, if there is any way um, for you to build a capacity or as a coalition for you to build capacity for smaller programs to do this, uh, really do it because it is a, a key in, in ending domestic violence and ending homelessness as a result of domestic violence. All right, with that, um, we have about three minutes left. Um, Mary Kate, if you can pull back up our slides for today. Um, I think we might have time for one question, and then um, we also want to share um, some closing thoughts from NRCDV. I've also mentioned in the chat some homework for us. Um, if you can take a question back to your community, please feel free to um, take this question on how we're meaningfully incorporating survivors into our um, initiatives, like any types of ways to improve um, that aspect. Um, yes, homework for all of us. And uh, if we can have um, our link um, for the DV HUD NOFO, um, please, Mary Kate, if you can pull back up the slides, um, just want to share where you can go um for for applying for this nofo it's 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 a very um like we mentioned earlier it's a very long uh document it's over 120 pages throughout our webinar we tried to reference some points of interest where you might want to take a closer look as to um what is um was it what is designated and you know some 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 good reading um for you to take that time like was mentioned earlier on the weekend or like I like to do while I'm washing dishes, um, take a look in that, um, at the NOFO specifically. Um, so hopefully you all had a, a chance to take some of those, um, so those reference points down. And um, here are a few more links, uh, preparing for the NOFO um, from HUD, from the Continuum of Care. Um, and also more information for tribal communities uh, and the all-in uh, federal strategic plan from USICH, a few um, links from them, and also from the National Alliance to End Homelessness. They have really an immense amount of knowledge on when it comes to homelessness um, activities in general. Um, please look into their website for more guidance on the NOFO. And um, if we can have the link um, to the NOFO, that would be great. Just wanna say um, thank you. Thank you so much um, uh, for, for joining us today. Please um, bookmark our website, safehousingpartnerships.org. Um, there's a lot more, um, more in-depth um, webinars, uh, tutorials, toolkits on how to approach um, incorporating a really uh, survivor-centered framework and all of those, we talked about racial equity. You can see that on our website um, and our partners uh, really that are doing the critical work as part of the consortium. Um, go ahead and bookmark that site. And the last slide, please, um, which is our link to the DV NOFO, go out, um, celebrate the NOFO in your communities. Um, please, um, we, we talked about, you know, all those things, those hesitancies. Um, start making it part of regular conversation. 
to start to start talking about NOFO and uh, grant writing opportunities um, and engage, like DFOX said earlier, engage with your COCs and apply when you're ready. Don't give up and let's end homelessness for survivors and really celebrate the NOFO in your communities and um, teams of care. Thank you so much for joining us today. And um, we will be in contact um, to continue this really in pivotal conversations. Bye, everyone.